Starting our list off at number 10, don't steal crops. In medieval times, stealing crops was considered a very serious crime. As funny as it may seem in your head, see a guy grab a vegetable and run away. Crops were a vital source of food and income for farmers and communities. There's no Uber Eats back then, all right? Somebody steals your tomatoes, you're fucked. In some cases, the punishment might be a fine or restitution paid for the victim, while in more serious cases, the thief might be subjected to public humiliation or physical punishment, such as whipping or branding. Yeah, branding somebody publicly, all because you ate the wrong apple off the wrong tree. Repeat offenders might, of course, face more severe punishments because something's afoot here, okay? We're not buying your story this time. Such as imprisonment or banishment from the community. Yeah, banishment. Just get out of here. Next village. See ya. Overall, stealing crops was not taken lightly in medieval society at all, and it could result in significant consequences for the offender. Branded, getting branded because you stole a crop. That's embarrassing almost. Number nine, don't steal at all. Yeah, let's rewind the clocks back a bit more. Don't take anything ever. How's that sound? Sweden's Bjarki laws were a set of Viking era laws that governed maritime trade and piracy. Now, they were enacted in 832 AD, pretty old school, and they included punishments for various crimes, including theft and piracy. The punishment for stealing in a Viking society, it of course varied depending on the severity of the crime, the value of the stolen goods, and or the social status of the offender. But for minor thefts, the offender might be required to pay restitution or make amends to the victim. This could involve returning the stolen goods, paying a fine to them directly, or performing a service for them, you're basically a slave for them. For more serious offenses, such as repeated thefts or stealing from a chieftain, a chieftain, the punishment might be more harsh. And this is where we get into the nitty gritty of our list. Here, the offender might be stripped of their social status, exiled from the community, or even, yeah, killed, the worst of the worst. Now, in some cases, the punishment for stealing could also involve public shaming. That in the Viking era, I didn't want to know what that would look like. The offender might be paraded through the community or subjected to other forms of humiliation. Yeah, we'll get to the lung stuff a little bit later on. Slowly but surely, we'll get there. You have to start at theft and then work our way to the lunging and the horrible knee-breaking stuff. Number eight, arson. Capital punishment was a common punishment for arson in the medieval age. Sounds a bit harsh, but hear me out. Last time I was on this channel, I was talking about the Great Fire of 1666. It took 15 lives, but ultimately this fire, it forced officials to rebuild a great part of the city, restructured everything. This changed history. Fire in medieval towns equals trouble. It's gonna spread quite fast. A lot of wood, a lot of woody stuff. So if you were found guilty for arson, well, buddy, you're screwed. Arson, the deliberate setting of fire to property, it was considered a serious crime and was often punished severely in order to deter others from committing similar crimes, right? In some cases, arsonists were killed by hanging or they were burned themselves at the stake. Yeah, burning at the stake was a particularly gruesome form of capital punishment in which the accused was tied to a post or a stake and then they were set on fire. Again, this is all a public affair. People came out to watch this, horrible. Horrible, hide your, hide your eyes. We're not gonna watch this one. Number seven, amputation. While amputation was not a common punishment in Viking societies, there are historical accounts of it being used in extreme cases of punishment, which is absolutely crazy. I'll tell you two of them. One example is the story of Orm of Lyre, who was a wealthy farmer in Norway during the 11th century. Now Orm, old Orm here, he was accused of multiple killings, including the killing of a chieftain and was sentenced to have his hands and his feet Amputated. Yeah, you can't kill anyone when you don't have any mitts, apparently. This was a severe punishment that was reserved for the most serious of the most serious, and it was intended to permanently disable the offender and hopefully prevent them from committing further crimes. Example number two, Edvin Kniffri. He was a wealthy farmer, again, another farmer in rough times. He was a wealthy farmer in Iceland during the 10th century. Now, Edvin, he was accused of stealing cattle, and as a punishment, his nose and his ears we're cut off. Do you hear that? That's Edvin's ears getting cut off. It's horrible. You can't show it, but I can definitely act it. This form of punishment was intended to publicly shame the offender and serve as a warning to others. Yeah, I see Edvin over there. Old non-ear Edvin. That's why you don't steal. Number six. Slavery. Slavery, of course, was a common practice in Viking or medieval societies, and it was often used as a punishment for crimes such as theft, piracy, and debt. As I said earlier, if you steal enough stuff, you owe people far too much. Now they own you. According to the Bjarki laws, a set of Viking era laws governed in you know, 832, I mentioned that earlier as well, individuals who were unable to pay their debts could 
and will be sold into slavery. Yeah, you gotta pay some way. Vikings also engaged in the slave trade. They captured individuals during these raids and they sold them as slaves in markets across Europe and the Middle East. Slavery was an integral part of the Viking economy and many Viking households had slaves actively who were performing various tasks such as farming, household chores, and even military service. The treatment of slaves in Viking societies varied depending on the individual owner, but slaves were generally considered property and had few legal rights. Yeah, we don't look at that often when we look at medieval history. We often just imagine guys like me with big beards, you know? Number five, denailing. <sighs> okay. The forcible extraction of one's fingernails or toenails. Or both. Lovely. Hey, before we move on, let's give that thumbs up a click. Yeah, the little thumbnail right there that we see on the screen. Let's spread a little positivity into this list. I need it. I don't know. I feel like you need it as well. Thank you so much. Back to denailing. This was a favorite method of medieval punishment because, well, sounds horrible, but it was easy. You just needed a really strong guy and some medieval pliers and, well, Bob's your uncle. You're getting the confession. A variant used in medieval Spain introduced a sharp wedge of wood underneath the flesh and in between the actual nail itself which is horrible. The wedge was then slowly hammered into this grove more and more until the nail popped off. Yeah, thumbs up for thumbnails popping off in history. We try here on B. Number four, Dimnaccio ad bestias, also known as killing by wild animals. I'm a dog lover too, I can't read this one. Dimnaccio ad bestias was a form of Roman capital punishment in which the accused was killed by wild animals in the arena. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, oh, kind of similar to Gladiator and what they had to do. No, this was much sooner. This was a little different. This was 80 years sooner. Now, at this point, and Gladiator, they could defend themselves to some degree. Those meeting their fate with this method, they were always defenseless and sometimes tied to one spot. Or they were given a small weapon made of wood. It was an insult, really, no chance of surviving. This form of punishment was seen in ancient Rome starting around the second century BC, but 80 or so years later, the Colosseum then saw a similar practice. Only then it was public viewing, it was a big spectacle, it was an event. And most importantly, gladiators could fight back with tridents or nets. Both are horrible. I'd rather just get it done with, to be honest. I'm not fighting a lion. No way. Look at me. I'm like 110 pounds soaking wet. I'm not gonna fight. I'll fight a zebra, maybe. I'll fight like an emu. I could probably take an emu. Number three, hanging. Again, a little straightforward, but I'll try and provide some history for this one. Sure, some hanging history. Okay, ugh. Hanging is quick. I mean, that's when it's supposed to be. Hanging can be one of two ways. Suspension by the limbs as a form of punishment or hanging by the neck as a form of capital punishment. We don't often think about the first version. Being strung up by an arm, that's gotta suck. That's pretty uncomfortable. I can't even raise my arm in class for longer than five minutes. I gotta switch it up. Know what I mean? These shoulders are weak. Strapado, oh, this would have been a nightmare. Strapado was the form in which your wrists were tied behind your head, eventually causing your shoulders to dislocate. I don't know what's worse out of all three of those. They all suck. I would do the get it done with, honestly. I don't want to live for any of this. Number two, rats. If you're a rat lover, this one's gonna suck. I know some people have rats. They like to do tricks and crawl around their neck and in their mouths. That's cool. I'm not a rat guy myself, but don't knock it till I try it. Rat punishment originated in ancient Rome, and ever since then, it unfortunately has been part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments every era past. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal bin or an enclosure, a bucket of some sorts, strapped to his abdomen or his chest. Now inside this enclosure, there are rats, which the strapped down person can definitely feel walking and sniffing around on your bare skin. Now this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a bad hot environment for these rats inside. Now from here, these rats begin to panic, right? They frantically search for a way out, any way out, because like us, they have survival instincts. Metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. You can probably eat your way through that. You can see where this is going and you probably just went <gasps> at your computer. Yeah, there we go. Now you get it. Let's move on. Poor rats as well, right? Like, come on, those little animals, they don't want to do that. They don't want to eat a six pack today. I don't want that. Finally, number one, the rack. The rack was a device that was made out of a wooden rectangle as a frame. You've probably seen this in Game of Thrones and that's about it. The person being punished here would have their limbs attached to the four sides with chains and then the people doing the punishing with the helps of rollers and pulleys and a couple of very strong, very strong guys. They would stretch out the person until either the limbs were torn clean off from the body or they got pulled out from their sockets and then couldn't be used anymore. As I'm saying this, I want to faint. This is so horrible. I said I felt lightheaded typing this up. This is really bad. Imagine 
imagine being around in a time where people actually used to do this and you didn't just watch it on Game of Thrones for 12 bucks a month. And again, more often than not, it was public. So embarrassing watching your shoulder get popped out. You're like, oh, just stop. Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad. 
not good. And speaking of amputations, the classic rhinotomy is back. When is it not though? Pretty much every historical society was chopping off noses for some reason or another. This is because a mutilation of the extruding facial parts, so nose, ears and lips, had detrimental effects on sensory, but it was also a permanent alteration of the most expressive parts of the human body. Rhinotomy was practiced by Greeks, Indians, Romans, Biazetines, Chinese peoples and so on. While it was more prevalent in the Biazetiums than the Ottomans, it didn't change the fact that an unfaithful woman was subjected to it while the man could get away with just a flogging. The Ottomans and Biazetines also have documented history of having the husband of an unfaithful woman be forced to commit the mutilation. You're already heartbroken she cheated, now you gotta cut her face open too. Hard day for those guys. It also established rhinotomy as a punishment for Christian women who had consensual sexual relations with a Muslim man or a Muslim woman who had consensual sexual relations with a Christian man. Chop chop with the chop chopping guys, it's time to be flayed alive. All the nausea for this one. Flaying a person alive has been employed as a method of execution in different parts of the world for many centuries, including ancient Rome, medieval England, and the Ottoman Empire. The process of flaying someone starts with stripping the clothes of a victim and tying them suspended by the wrist and ankle. They always started with the scalp and the head as it inflicted the most suffering and you wanted them to still be alive for that part. Then making incisions vertically down the body, following the legs, buttocks, and torso, they would peel back and remove the skin as intact as possible. In some instances, parts of the person's body were even boiled to make the skin softer and easier to remove. So that's two for one torture right there. There were a few ways you could die from flaying, but never from flaying itself. Shock, blood or fluid loss, hypothermia or infection are some potentials. The time of death could also be anywhere between a few hours and a few days. In the aftermath, many of these corpses would be hung on stakes for their display, their skin either discarded or hung up beside them. And speaking of, our next brutal punishment is impalement. While Vled Sepes, aka Dracula, is famous for this torture, he actually learned it from the Turkish while held in captivity and tortured for his own homosexuality. With stake impalement, a victim's back door is forced down on the tip of a long, sharp, greased up stake. This starts the impalement process. The stake is then hoisted up and the body weight of the victim on the grease pole would slowly slide them downwards. The pole would travel up the intestinal opening and up through the body very, very slowly. It was a brutal, slow and agonizing death and it was one that could take days. Sometimes the Ottomans would flay someone before impalement. Gaunching was another type of brutal impaled death. The victim would be quite literally thrown onto metal spikes, hooks, or rods and then left to die on them. These hooks and spikes could be found over the edges of certain palace balconies. Gentlemen, tune out and don't say I didn't warn you. The next is the sack squish. According to the 1622 contemporary chronicles, the teenage Sultan Osman II suffered an excruciating death by compression of, well, his boys. By assassin known Known as Pevlian the oil wrestler. That's right, an oil wrestler crushed his scrot till he died. Wild. Sack crushing is a punishment that was performed as slowly as possible to worsen the intensity of a victim's agony and lengthen its duration. And it was often performed by a vice that would make them burst from the inside and then crunch the spermatic cord with a plier like attachment. This victim was usually held upside down while this occurred so that they're unable to pass out or enter a state of shock while the torture occurs. This was also because the condemned usually was vomiting repeatedly so it was just easier to hang him upside down over a bucket. Despite vomiting, the men rarely screamed. This is because the pain would be so physically overwhelming enough that it would affect his ability to even breathe. They would however thrash around wildly as each of the boys burst and then the cord was crunched. And don't worry, they would make a full day of torture out of this. Interesting to notice how usually these public spectacles drew crowds due to the lack of entertainment and also their intention to be a public spectacle. Well unlike flayings or drownings or dismemberment where there's usually jeers and cheering, apparently with a good old sack squish, the crowds remained silent and shocked the whole time. Onlookers, male and female, are recorded to have vomited at the site. And now, a race for your life. This strange custom began in the 18th century and lasted well into the 19th. This custom only applied to viziers of the sultan who committed a crime or were simply told they were being executed. It happened a lot, and for next to no reason. The official would be summoned to a meeting with the head gardener, and after exchanging greetings, the vizier would be handed a cup of sherbet. If it was white, then the sultan had granted him life. If it was red, he was to be executed. As soon as he saw red sherbet, the vizier would start sprinting. Well, that's because the color red was the color of blood, and if the vizier wanted to keep it in his body, he could escape his fate by beating the head gardener, who moonlighted as the Ottoman's executioner by the way, in a race through the palace gardens. The head gardener was honor bound to a foot race through the gardens to the place of execution near the fish market gate on the southern side of the palace, a distance of around 
300 meters. If the vizier was able to finish the dash before the head gardener slash executioner, their sentence would be reduced from death to simple banishment. If the gardener was there, you might as well just keep running right off of a cliff. It isn't clear how this racing tradition got started, although one can speculate it was probably inspired by condemned individuals literally making the mad dash. The last man to save his neck by winning a life or death sprint was Grand Vizier Hakia Sahel Pasha in November of 1822. Hakia, whose predecessor had only lasted nine days in office before being executed, not only survived the death sentence, but was so widely esteemed for winning the race that he went on to be appointed the governor general of the province of Damascus. So we'll start with punishment one, tattooing. You may have seen our video, the top 10 messed up punishments from the Tokugawa era, in which case tattoos as punishment may sound familiar. While Japan and China were on different wavelengths and doing their own things, this is something they had in common for criminals. Although tattooing has been known in China for centuries, it has been in the most part an uncommon practice outside of their indigenous peoples. Throughout Chinese history, tattooing has been seen as a defamation of the body, something undesirable, and this originates likely with the penal tattooing as one of the five capital punishments in ancient China. The first, and considered the lightest of the five punishments, had criminals' upper cheeks or forehead or other visible parts of the body tatted up. It was usually words that described their misdemeanors or the location of their exile or name of their hard labor camp. These tattoos are obviously permanent and very visibly marked out their bearers as ex-criminals for life. Even should the criminal ever return from exile, the tattoo would mark them as what they were. The Kinlaw Code covered so many offenses that common people frequently did not realize they had committed a crime until they'd been arrested. So you really could be just minding your business one day and boom, face tat the next. Next is amputations. So after tattoos, the next was rhinotomy, aka the snip snip of a criminal's nose. Like tattooing, it left the victim scarred for life. But because sharp items and blood were involved, rhinotomy and the next two penalties following after often resulted in death, even if not their intention, just due to things like bleeding out or infections. Then level three is amputation of feet, aka you. Modern day scientists have been examining a skeleton that was found from 3,000 years ago where the foot of a woman was cut off as punishment for committing a criminal act. Various clues hint that the woman's foot was cut off as a U. Her bones show no signs of any disease that could have made such an amputation necessary, and it seems that the injury was roughly made, rather than with the precision of a medical amputation. There were variations in punishments in different periods where the choice of foot removed depended on the severity of the crimes committed. Amputation of the right foot for a very serious crime, and the left for lighter offenses. It would seem that the woman who was determined to be in her early 30s when she died, had committed the former. There is extensive historical evidence of the practice of the third punishment, such as documents of a Chinese official in the millennial BC complaining about the demand to find special shoes for their amputee people. Remove the reproductives. It's called gong, the permanent removal of a person's reproductive function. Male victims of this punishment were castrated, losing the member as well as their boys. A very famous casualty it was Sima Qian, a Namaskar father of traditional Chinese history writing. Gong punishments for female victims were harder as in the older times they didn't really know what was going on all up in there or how to access it. So it might have involved pounding a woman's abdomen with a stout stick to introduce some kind of damage to the womb. Call that waka -like womb I guess? But I'm no? No. All right. Then the final in the code, the last of the five punishments was death, obviously. However, there were different variations of death, from simple strangulation or decapitation to boiling or grilling a person alive and making literal mincemeat out of a person's flesh and then salting it. They got gorgeous with it, guys. The cruelty was deliberate and designed to cause maximum pain to the victims and their families, as well as to shock and deter others from committing similar crimes. A criminal might be sentenced to death by strangulation if less punitive, or decapitation if more punitive. Strangulation was actually prescribed sentence for lesser crimes, lodging an accusation against one's parents or grandparents, scheming to kidnap a person and sell them, opening a coffin while desecrating a tomb. Decapitation was a method of execution prescribed for more serious crimes such as treason or sedition. Despite a great discomfort involved, most of the Chinese people actually preferred strangulation to decapitation in the ancient times. And this is the result of the 
the traditional belief that the body is a gift from the parents and that it is therefore disrespectful to one's ancestors to die without returning one's body to the grave intact. Executions were usually carried out at 11.30 a.m. on the day of the execution. The convict would be carted from the jail cell to the execution grounds. The cart stopped at a wine shop named the Broken Bowl on the east side of the Zuanwu Gate, where the convict would be offered a bowl of rice wine. The bowl would be smashed after it was drunk, opa, and then her heads chopped off and promptly sent to the emperor. Now finished with the five official punishments, let's check out some other horrors, like the kangu, a type of large wooden collar placed around the necks of offenders, which could weigh differently depending on the severity of their crimes. Speaking of which, the Chinese Empire really said, and we have the receipts for it too guys, as the criminals past crimes would be attached to the wooden collar, most of the time for the public to see, grocery list style. The kangu also restricted a person's movements, so it was common for people wearing kangus to start to death as they were unable to feed themselves and sometimes not even move from one place. If people were generous enough to offer food to the roadside kangoo wearers, they could also see the list of their crimes and determine based off of that if they deserved their generosity at all. After all, it was a device used for public humiliation and corporal punishment. Imagine seeing someone you've beefed with forever pop up one day on the street corner wearing one of these. You can just walk up and read everything they did wrong, just attach to them. That's satisfaction for a grudge hole. Older man. Number five, sawing. Yeah, sawing. You know, again, another one I don't have to explain too much here, hopefully. Mostly seen in Rome, Spain, and some portions of Asia. It's common. It's a pretty common, straightforward idea, sawing is. You can imagine this one already, right? We sure hope you can because, well, we can't show it. Of course. This is another straightforward one, unfortunately. Capital punishment at its cruelest, getting sawed in half. Again, to the public. Yeah, here's a fun one. Here's a fun show. Drive-in movies or sawing? I'm not sure. Here's a fact that some folk don't quite realize. This one sends shivers down my spine. But sometimes the sawing was done from top to bottom, not side to side. It's almost impressive, right? It's like cutting a carrot in half vertically. It's a little awkward. It's rolling around a bit. But you know what? They did it somehow through bones and your soul. Mozzatello, occasionally used by the papal states for only some of the most, you know, terrible crimes or crimes that were considered bad at the time. Basically, the person who was being taken care of, they would be led to a scaffold that was located again in the public square, classic. Everyone come on out, grab your family, your aunts, your uncles, we're watching something today, classic. This person would be accompanied by a priest and on the scaffold would lie a coffin. How fitting, a coffin and of course, a masked executioner who is dressed in all black with the zipper mouth probably, I don't know. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, because I mean, sure, everyone's watching, like, oh yes, of course. And then when that time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Now, sometimes, and hopefully this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would just render them unconscious, which would then lead them to their throat being, you know, you get it. None of these sound great, but this one, it sucks really bad. It's like, hey, you're gonna get hit, and then it might get worse, I don't know. Necklacing. I'm never wearing my necklace ever again. Here we go. Necklacing is a terrifying practice that involves a rubber tire, not a necklace, a rubber tire, and unfortunately, it involves a human being as well. The rubber tire is filled with petrol, which is then put around the victim's chest and arms, and they can't move, and then after that, they are set ablaze. Yeah, you figured that was coming. You think I'm talking about the hills have eyes or something terrible, but no, this was real life. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out what happens next, but this method, sadly, can take up to 20 minutes for somebody to pass away from. Little different than the elephant stuff, you know what I mean? They're just left suffering the whole entire time. This one wasn't too public. Nobody could stick around for this one. Cause you know, 20 minutes, no way. I could barely get through a 10 minute YouTube video. You wanna watch this guy burn for 20 minutes? Good joke, how horrible. Impalement. This was another one that was highly requested by you guys. I've heard you comment on this a couple times. So yeah, I'll talk about it, sure, you weirdos. Impaling, do impaling, long neck, impaling. I'm like, you got it. I hear ya, I see ya, let's make it happen. Vlad the Third, also known as Vlad the Impaler or something like that. He liked doing a little bit of something like this. This was a popular form a punishment for a very long time, sadly, and was most commonly used as a response to crimes against the state. Although Mr. Vlad, we just mentioned, basically did it to everybody that he didn't like, so I suppose to each their own. Sure. All right, Vlad the Third. Maybe Vlad the Fourth won't do that. Let's hope. Impalement was a method of both torture and obviously execution that involved, well, just slowly driving a stake or a pole or a spear or a big carrot, something pointy or whatever, through a person in order to completely or partially. Um, 
perforate their torso. There we go, I sound like a Victorian scientist. You can impale somebody vertically or again, horizontally if you wanna spice it up. Instead of going this way, you go, oh, that's really bad. Ducking stools. Medieval times, here we go. If you can do math, you're going for a swim. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century in England and New England. And it was uh, usually a punishment that was reserved for women. Women who uh, could do bed mass. There you go, you're a witch. Have a, have a nice dip. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly things. Back then, whatever that was supposed to mean. And it was ridiculous. Apparently this included things like having an argument with their husband, taking a dip, fighting with the neighbors, you're going for a swim. Gossiping and backstabbing, how dare thee, you're going swimming. Whoever made these rules clearly had never met a man or a friend because news flash, everyone does all those things. I did all those before I even came in here to film, so hopefully I don't get dunked in the river. But basically this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again while a bunch of dudes with no teeth watched and they're like, yeah, that's what you get for being smart. And talking back with your opinions. On International Women's Day, we're posting this one too, eh? How ironic is that? Now kicking off our list at number 10, the boot. Anything that starts with a the, it's bad news right there. Oversized boots made of iron or copper, these are a little different than Uggs, pay attention. These boots were often brazed onto the floor, so the accused, well, ideally they couldn't move around anywhere at all. Most of the time they were just sitting upright, they were stuck, it was welded to the ground. The boots at this time were filled with boiling water, or molten lead, both pretty bad. And from that point on, well, it's not gonna be great. You're probably not gonna survive. Another medieval punishment involving boots, which is somehow worse, in my opinion, was first seen in Ireland. They were lightweight metal boots that were filled with water and then heated over a fire until the water was boiling, as well as your feet. I don't know, comment down below, which is worse? To me, the second one is way worse. I don't like a slow boil, I don't like that. A watched pot never boils. Maybe that trick will work, who knows? Number nine, the instep borer. We'll start at the feet and we'll make our way up to the body. Why not? The instep borer was a medieval German punishment instrument. Again, quite creative, these medieval folks. This iron boot was much more mobile than the last pair of boots, that one for sure. See, this was just one shoe, rather. A shoe that hinged open to allow your foot to slide in. And then from then on out, just trouble. Slow chaos. A crank would protrude out of the top of the foot, and if you were to turn said crank slowly, well, on the inside of this iron shoe was a thick serrated iron blade, cutting deeper and deeper with each rotation of the crank. This location of this crank was purposeful because most of the time, the accused would bleed out fast. No recovering from that one. Still better than Uggs, in my opinion, but whatever. Number eight. Branks. Ah, the branks. Here we go. Sounds horrible. Branks were used to punish nagging wives, or slandering wives, or cursing wives, or women who performed or practiced witchcraft. If you criticize Christianity, love it. But if you had an opinion or you can do math, you get the branks pretty much. It was horrible. A scold's bridle, or branks, much more fun to say, was a device usually reserved for women. Yeah, classic medieval times history. It wasn't just a muzzle either. We always look at it as if it was a muzzle. No, it was a lot worse than that. It was a cage for the head with an iron plate projecting into the mouth, even pressing down on top of the tongue. More often than not, this plate was studded with spikes so that if the tongue moved at all, ergo, if you were to speak, it would cause you to bleed out. Now again, you can't open your mouth with this device, so that is double trouble. It was first seen in Scotland back in 1567 and later used in England. Branks were commonly used, again, on women of the lower classes whose speech was troublesome. Yeah, what does it even mean, right? Some shaped like an animal's head so you'd have a cow for somebody that was considered lazy, a donkey for someone considered a fool, a hare for an eavesdropper, or a pig for a glutton. Yeah, God forbid you had an opinion in the dark ages. Number seven, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that one wasn't too comfortable to sit on. Just a chair of swords. The iron chair has spikes covering the back, all along the armrests, the seat, there's spikes, there's spikes everywhere, it's dangerous. 500 to 1500 rusty spikes on average per chair. That's a lot of work, it's a lot of welding work, my gosh. The victim's wrists were tied to the chair, of course, because you'll want to get off of it immediately. Now that's bad enough, being stuck sitting on this chair, but some variants got creative and made it even somehow worse. Some variants of the iron chair had holes underneath the chair's bottom, and that's where red hot coals would be placed to cause you severe burns. It's like from Casino Royale, only a a lot, lot worse. Sometimes weights would even be added, making matters much worse. Now this chair was meant to get a confession out of the accused because although it sounds quite fatal, no spikes could actually penetrate a vital organ and wound
wounds were closed immediately by the spikes themselves. Sounds awful, but it wasn't the worst. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. You didn't die all the time. Number six, coffins. I'm not talking about, you know, these types of coffins with vampires. Like, you know, coffins you bury in the ground. That would be a bad way to go out, no doubt about it. But this coffin that I'm talking about, much, much worse. Here, the victim was placed up high, not down below. They were placed up high in a cage that was so small, you could barely fit inside of it. Stuck in one spot, usually with limbs sticking out. The live victim was most of the time left to starve or die of thirst or exposure. Yeah, those limbs sticking out, insects, the sun all day, it doesn't matter what you get at this point, but it's slow and it's gonna suck. And of course, in medieval fashion, it's gonna be quite public. Everyone's not working, no one has jobs in medieval times, we're all just watching some guy stuck in a cage, we're like, sure, this is it, we're living, UFC. Natsurushi is number five. The Japanese were incredibly determined to keep Christian colonialists out of their nation. They represented imperialism and they were known to be dangerous outsiders, bringing foreign diseases and unnecessary wars and Politics. Essentially, they didn't come quietly, they came quite noisily and bossily, and the Japanese just weren't feeling that. Now, the method they chose actually turned out to be incredibly effective and withheld Christianity from the country for far longer than many others had. This is because it was a wildly brutal method. Anatsurushi was used in the 17th century to coerce Christians to recant their faith after entering Japan. Victims would be hung upside down, suspended by their feet, and often lowered into a hole, itself often filled with excrement at the bottom. A cut would be made in the forehead, a around the temple area in order to let the blood pressure decrease in the area around their head. The aim was to break their resolve, to renounce their faith, or they would eventually die. For this reason, one of their hands would be left free and exposed so they may signal upwards a willingness to recant. Both Japanese and Western Christians are known to have been submitted to this torture. Sometimes there was a doctor around just to resuscitate them so they can continue being tortured. They were also subjected to head down crucifixion and water crucifixion. Water style was carried out by putting an upside down cross at the shoreline low enough at the tide at low tide and waiting for the tide to rise so that the person would eventually drown. Christians were treated this way until 1873 when Christianity was finally allowed into Japan. And since we're already on the topic number 4 is crucifixion. While it's unclear when crucifixion was introduced into Japan, likely 12th to 16th century, it had already had a 2000 year history when that when they did. So, the Japanese added some of their own twists to it. As you heard previously with the mention of an upside down or a water crucifixion it was one of the three executions reserved for the worst of offenders. Alongside beheading and hanging, sometimes the three punishments would be mixed and matched. For example, crimes against individuals of higher social status and against family members or one's master could result in beheading prior to crucifixion. Adultery, theft, and subterfuge are all crucible offenses as they threatened both the social and political order. The person to be crucified would be carried out on horseback nude, a lot adding to the humiliation of their sentence. He'd be poked and prodded with staffs by the assigned guards who would also carry a large banner with the person's name, offense, and punishment. Oh yeah, they aired your dirty laundry on the march to your grave. This route would also be set to pass the accused residence as well as the location of their crime scene. The accused was then tied at the execution site and when the cross was risen and mounted with the accused tied upon it, the guards used their staffs to spear him repeatedly until a final thrust to the throat for an ending blow. The boiling point is number three. Large cauldrons were used by the Japanese for boiling fish to retrieve oil, preparing rice, soups, and cooking people alive. This particular torture was a remnant of the warring states period that I've mentioned to come before Tokugawa. They were completely masochismic in that time period. The Tokugawa empire saw that and ended quite a few of these punishments because of it. But not at first. This is why I can tell you how the Tokugawa would fill these jumbo sized cauldrons with cold water and put it over over a blazing fire. As the water began to warm, the accused would be told hop on in. What starts as an arguably nice toasty bath begins to boil. The accused is to remain in hot water until they confessed. Now this was only used as an ordeal when the judge and jury were very convinced of a person's guilt, but the person just wasn't fessing up. It could sometimes also constitute as a mode of punishment or execution. For example, an entire family in the 16th century were boiled alive in a gigantic bathtub as a punishment for a failed assassination. Another fun ordeal was using a pan of boiling water and having the accused dip their arm into it. If they refused to do it, they were assumed guilty. If they didn't got burned, they were also assumed guilty. Only if you could stick your arm in boiling water and come out unscathed are you innocent, because that makes sense. Number two, we pull the saw, or don't. 
don't will sound better in a second. So like a few others on this list, the Tokugawa's let this torturous execution method from the past dynasty enter into theirs. However, they made some changes in the brutality of it. But before this change, this execution method allowed for an interactive experience. So step right up boys and girls, who is twisted enough to slowly saw at the head of a man buried alive? In a book by Louis Freud regarding Japanese history, he describes the grisly execution of a samurai slash bounty hunter. The man had attempted to claim a bounty target, but missed a shot. While he had escaped, it wasn't for long. He was captured and identified, and he was sentenced to the pulling the saw. The man had been buried up to his neck, and a saw set up next to him, with the signboard inviting passerbys to cut at his neck, slowly hacking the men's head off alive. Now, traditionally, the saw is also placed close enough to the victim's throat that the accused, while buried alive, could make the decision to speed up the process if they really wanted to. But like I said, changes were made. Metal saws, they were replaced with bamboo ones. And rather than being used to actually saw off the living's heads as they once were, they were now simply put on public display next to the condemned person for periods of days prior to their execution by other means. And number one is the painful honor seppuku, which literally translates means self-disembowelment. So before I unpack that statement, there are two forms of this execution, voluntary and obligatory. Obligatory. Voluntary is pretty rare. Circumstances such as warriors defeated in battle, awaiting execution by their enemies, and not wanting the dishonor of that. Meanwhile, obligatory seppuku refers to the method of capital punishment for samurai to spare them the disgrace of being beheaded by a common executioner. This form of execution was ritualized as a result. Great emphasis is put on the proper performance of the ritual. It's to be carried out in the presence of one or more witnesses sent by an authority who had ha issued the execution. While kneeling, the samurai would take a small dagger or short sword from a small table placed before him. The proper method, developed over several centuries, was plunging this weapon into your left abdomen, drawing the blade up laterally to the right and then turning it upwards. A truly exemplary samurai would then remove the blade and push it into his sternum across the first cut and then up to pierce the throat. This is a brutally painful and extremely slow death to experience. Weirdly, for this twisted reason, it was favored by the warrior code used by the samurai as an effective way to demonstrate the courage, self-control, and strong resolve of the samurai and to prove the sincerity of purpose even when facing their own crimes. Women of the samurai class also committed ritual takings of lives, but instead of slicing the abdomen, they slashed their throat with a short sword or dagger, a little easier on the girlies, I guess. First up is probably the least horrible you could get, galley labor. And while it wasn't traditional in Islamic law, corvi or galley labor was introduced into the Ottoman labor system over the course of the 16th century in response to the growing manpower needs of the navy and city construction. These sentences were granted for a wide variety of offenses, including theft, atheism, drunkenness, homicide, sexual employment, forced intercourse, bribery, document foraging, the list goes on. A sentence was never under a year, but usually an average of eight. Apart from the offenses mentioned above, galley sentences could be issued in lieu of other sentences if there is a demand for rowers from the imperial or local fleets meaning the manpower needed for the navy could sometimes override a decision of execution or imprisonment or even take death row prisoners to sea with them. The catch was that most sentences did not specify the time a criminal had to serve. It was left to the ship admiral or captain to release prisoners when and where he chose. So sometimes when a captain was convinced that the convict had reformed himself but he needed all the hands on deck available, well you're not going anywhere. You could quite literally be worked to death. It was just as true for the Ottoman as it was for the Habsburg government then, that it used galley sentences to enforce social control, even if the proportion of convicts in the Ottoman navy never reached the levels of the Spanish fleet. The grim reality of the penal system subordinated to the demands of imperial projects is that what separated life and death for someone was often whether they were physically fit enough to pull an oar. Next up is gonna sting, it's a kerbash. This follows galley and corvee labor because it was commonly used on the convicts discussed above. A kerbash is a strap style whip that averages a yard in length. Traditionally, they were made of hippo or rhino leather and was used as a punishment and torture instrument. And the state loved these things. They were widely employed by officials for various purposes of the state, including the obtaining of confessions from criminals, the collection of taxes, and the enforcement of corvee and galley labor. In the interest of maintaining agricultural 
productivity and increasing state revenue, we saw the use of corvi labor, which was crop and construction version of galley labor. It was a common practice for the foremen to enforce this type of labor by applying a whip on the fellahin, which is the name for those criminals. This whip, made of particularly strong but dry leather, was said to be able to peel the skin off in sheets from its blows. If a trained hand wielded this against you, bones could break and skin could blister and even get friction burns. Part of the comfortable use was that it was codified in the Kanan a the 1830s set of codes that dealt with crime and punishment. Within 55 articles dealing with offenses related to land cultivation, damages to public property, the offenses by public employees, 26 articles prescribe the use of a kibosh as punishment. A kibosh was sometimes an instrument used in our next punishment, foot whipping. Also called falanga or falaka, one of the best examples I can think of in media is actually the second season of Criminal Minds, when Spencer Reed is taken hostage by a religion crazed killer who tortures him with this method. Unlike most types of flogging, it is meant to be more painful than cause any actual injury to the victim. The received person is forced to be barefoot so that the soles of the feet are exposed. Ottoman falaka method has the victim also lie on their back with their feet elevated and bound. The underside arc of the feet are then repeatedly whipped. Falaka is usually carried out with a rigid and often heavy stick. It accordingly causes blunt trauma, leaving the person unable to walk and often impeded even for life. The Ottoman version causes more serious injuries than any other because of how the victims are bound. The person undergoing the falaka can twitch and struggle to a certain degree, and as a result, the stroke can land more randomly and can strike more injury prone areas of the foot. The toes and feet bones will break, as will the shins, and then shin splints were also a side effect, and some people experience knee displacement as well. The immediate experience of pain is described as stinging and searing. The subsequent pain from the succession of strokes is often described as throbbing, piercing, and burning, followed by fainting. Next up is swimming sacks, and not like an oversized ugly bathing suit, although we've all had one of those and it generally does feel like you're swimming in a sack. Anyways, a common execution for women, when they were executed, was being condemned into weighted sacks and dropped into the Bafora Sea. A story remains of how Sultan Ibrahim once executed his entire harem this way. Apparently one member had slept with another man, or Ibrahim simply wanted to noob ladies to pick from either way. 280 women were rounded up and put into weighted sacks that were tied shut around their necks. The reason we know this story is one of them apparently lived to tell the tale. Raising eyebrows in Western Europe when her rescue by a French ship became a public sensation and her story swept newspapers. Hadad crime and punishment is next on our list. Not all of these are found in the Ottoman history as there's some back and forth between the powers that be in the ways of religion. However, there are accounts of Hadad crimes being punished in Hadad fashions. Early Muslim jurists inherited the concept of a category of crimes called Hadad from references to it made by the Prophet. Their scholars agree that Hadad includes a multitude of crimes, including adultery, consuming intoxicants, false fornication accusations, some theft, armed robbery, or banditry. These are considered violations of the rights of God and human rights. These punishments are specified in the Quran and they're doled out differently each time. For example, adultery holds a punishment of a hundred lashes, which would be done with a kibosh. And if one or both parties were single, they should also have a year of exile. A thief should have their hands cut off as a deterrent for further thievery. And someone who accuses someone else of adultery better have four witnesses alongside them. If they can't provide witnesses, they get 80 lashes and will never have their testimony accepted ever again. The Ottoman Empire was known for the removal of thieves' hands and sometimes feet, but also doled out amputation punishment for a few other crimes, such as disloyalty and perjury. At number five, demand. In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. 
At number 4, Procurement. The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you could imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape, and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103. BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Now before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me if you would ever want to go back in time and visit ancient Rome. I'm sure there was a lot in ancient Rome that people would want to see and experience for themselves, so let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Starting our list off at number 10, trial by elephants. Yeah, we'll start with animals. You know what? I love animals. Why not? First of all, I'm not sure if you've ever seen an elephant in real life before, but these things are mightier than you can ever imagine. They're gorgeous animals, but they're incredibly dangerous to be near. Their foot is like, it's massive. It's like a huge tree stump. It's insane. For this punishment, we have to head to a place, of course, where elephants can be found. That's probably a promising start. South and Southeast Asia. Elephants have been trained for years to trample the accused. Now, depending on which elephant you get in this horrible, horrible demise, they were trained to either get the job done fast or slow. Yeah, imagine an elephant getting the job done quickly. Sounds like something you'd never want to witness for yourself, right? Wrong. No, these punishments were all public. It was almost like a show, like ancient Romans Colosseum. We think of that and we think of lions and we're like, wow, that must've been terrifying. Yeah, imagine that, but now it's an elephant with a big floppy nose too, really loud. They're loud, that's a scary way to go. But at least that's a quick way to go, unlike this next one here. Number nine, drawing and quartering. 
You know you're screwed when there's an and. Drawing and quartering. Wait, there's more. This is one of the most infamous methods of punishments. Now, this punishment was first doled out in England back in the 13th century. Now, the accused was, of course, as you'd guess, drawn or tied to a horse and then dwelt dragged to the gallows. And then at that point, they would usually be hanged. Maybe disemboweled, maybe beheaded, maybe be withered. I don't know. Other words that start with B, that's pretty horrible. Afterwards, the guilty was, of course, as you guessed, quartered. In other words, he had his body split into different parts, you know. Some, sometimes each limb would be tied to a different horse and then have them run in different directions. It was creative, if I'm being honest, a little bit creative. The choreography, the timing here, it was impeccable. This punishment was reserved for those guilty of treason and was thankfully abolished back in 1867. So no more horses involved, poor animals. Number eight, strapado. Strapado sounds like an Italian artist. It's for sure not. It's definitely not an artist. No. It's creative, again, I'll admit, but in the worst ways. It's an uncomfortable form of punishment, unlike others on this list. It doesn't necessarily always end in death. In strapado, the guilty is strung up by their wrists behind their head. Now, at first, this doesn't sound too bad, but again, just wait. The awkward angle is pretty much guaranteed to cause dislocation of the shoulders, but if that doesn't really kill you, weights may be added, and then at that point, your body's not gonna recover. Thought to have originated in medieval times, of course, always medieval times, could have guessed that one. During the Inquisition, Trapado has been used, sadly, into the 21st century. I don't know what they do in UFC, but there's probably a little bit of Strapado going on there. A little arm bar Strapado? No, no thanks. Number seven, keel hauling. As somebody who's not a fan of water, this type of punishment I can't even imagine. I wouldn't even get on the boat to begin with. Already scary. It sounds like something from Game of Thrones and it can vary depending on how bad the ocean or the boat is. Imagine that as a lead up. Yeah, the ocean looks pretty rough today. Maybe you'll make it. This punishment was reserved, of course, for sailors. Sailors at sea couple of naughty mateys. Now, it was first performed by the Dutch Navy back in the late 16th century, and what would happen was, while well, the accused, they would be tied with a rope and then dragged underwater from one end of a ship all the way to the other, around the rudder, around all that bad shit down there. And while many died, obviously, being flossed around a pirate ship covered in barnacles, it wasn't always fatal, if you can believe that. Not always, but a good amount of time, definitely. Yeah, you're not coming back from that. I can't even hold my breath for that long, no way. Number six, molten metal. I don't have to explain this one. This is, you've seen Game of Thrones. This is the worst. This should have been number one, maybe. I don't know, I'm guessing myself right now. This skin crawling punishment was a form of capital punishment because, well, yeah, there's no way you're gonna bounce back from this. While gruesome, this punishment has a fairly simple explanation. They would just pour molten metal or something extremely hot and not great down the accused throat. I'll, I'll tell you what, that's, that's probably gonna do the trick. At least it's gonna be fast, right? In Game of Thrones, it was pretty fast. There was like three minutes left in the episode. Guy did it, boom, roll credits. That's fine, that's a good way to go. Beats elephants, in my humble opinion. Usually during this punishment, they would do things to ensure that your throat would stay open during the pouring of the hot, hot metal. And to that, I have to ask, does that even matter at this point? Put on my face, my back, my feet, either way, I'm faint and I'm not waking up. Sounds like that show Uh-Oh from the 90s. Just dumping things. I don't want anything dumped on me. Milk, molten metal, rats, nothing. Number five, tarring and feathering. Okay, we've all heard about this one. It's brutal, of course, but the most shocking part is how many steps this one involves. You know what I mean? Like you'd think at the feather part, one guy would be plucking like, what are we doing? This is insane, I have to go home. This is, it's been hours here. This is horrible. This one goes as far back as 832 AD. This disgusting act has been going down for quite a while. Again, it's so many steps, this is horrible. Who invented this? A man stealing on trade journeys was to be tarred and feathered. This was for stealing during journeys. Again, this is what I'm saying about steps here. First, you'd have to shave this Viking's head, which I don't know if you've seen a Viking recently, but that's gonna take a minute. A lot of hair, sure. Then said Viking was covered in tar and then duck feathers chucked on top. Then as if it couldn't get much worse, this poor guy covered in feathers and tar was forced to run between two lines of the men that he lived with and stole from. Now at that point, these other guys would throw stones, bricks, anything painful, you name it. Now anybody caught not throwing an object at the feathery fellow was liable to be fined. So I know it sucks, but grab something and grab it quick. If the thief did make it through this line alive, again, after being tarred and feathered, then he was off the hook from there on out. Then he was, I guess, innocent? I don't know, that's horrible. I, I wouldn't make that, no way. Number four trial by ordeal. Quite the ordeal indeed. Look, I mentioned ordeal by fire earlier and that's quite a hot mess, but trial by ordeal is 
I have no words. Humans are so stupid, honestly. Introduced after Christianity, wild. Trial by ordeal was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it made absolutely zero sense at all. Basically, the accused would be placed into the center of everybody, and then they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. Like, they all just beat this person up. It was horrible, to say the least. If they survived all this pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, then they were guilty. Who thought, like, who wrote the rule book on this? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of insanity is going on here? But wait, it gets even better. If their wounds were clean and without infection after three days, then they would be found innocent because it was a sign that the gods had intervened to show their innocence. So, yeah, a lot of steps to be proven innocent. And healing, apparently, is one of them. Who knew? Number three, no insults. Yeah, the YouTube comments section could take a, a note from this one. Here we go. No insults. Be nice. This one's pretty good. This would change the game today. If you hurled insults at somebody back in the Viking Age, well, they were entitled to compensation. And they could summon everybody else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, they could be like, hey, you hurt my feelings. Give me $10. I guess that is happening today, but on a much larger scale. Comedians, really. If you spoke bad about somebody during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation, right? And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages. Again, we see this happen today in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. It's, it's too late, right? You spoke it, now it's out there. You did it. Your reputation was how you gained employment, met friends. It was a really important thing back then, more important than now. Can't be messed with, especially if you're a Viking. Yeah, no way. Also, if you insulted one man, you insulted his entire family as well. You know, the whole Viking rule. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said them to him. So yeah, choose wisely, I guess, with your insults. Number two, rap battles. Before we get to our big bad number one spot on today's list, we have to mention the best part of Viking tradition, in my humble opinion. Battles, but with words. Not with our fists, with our emotions. Flighting, or rap battles, or my favorite part of history, I would have killed it, honestly. I was writing some before lunch, and I think I'm okay. During those days, you needed ways to pass time, right? If you couldn't play hockey, and there weren't any villages to destroy, what does a Viking do? Why, you have loud poetry, that's what you do. Flighting comes from the old Norse flyta, meaning provocation. It's basically insult exchange, but make it theater. Now it's just... ASAP Rocky. Norse literature really has tales of their gods flighting. Imagine that. Imagine how cool that would be. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya in some sort of rap circle, some cipher. That'd be amazing. The whole purpose here was not to see who could diss the other's hometown the hardest, but rather this was a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. It's all brains and no brawn. A little different than traditional Viking battles, right? In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast. Imagine that. You'd enjoy a roast while watching a roast in real life. Double the roast, double the fun. Later, this was of course entertainment in the 15th and 16th centuries in Scotland. But don't get it twisted, Viking flighting got pretty intense. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. This was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. Again, if you're eating food right now, maybe give it a break for a minute. I don't know, giving you a heads up. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, historically, who both happened to be members of the royal family, they were both in the prone position, right? So they would lie flat on their tummies, then they would have their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create the sort of like, um, what do you, wings, I guess. Just like a nice lungy pair of wings. We love a creative Viking, I guess. Now, both instances where this insane punishment is said to have went down, historically, both of them were accused of killing their own fathers, so. I don't know what was going on back then or who's doing what, but we've got some daddy issues that are not being handled well at all. So don't do that, I guess. Don't do any part of that at any time. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? I can barely carve a pumpkin in one go. You know what I mean? My wrist gets tired. I can't do that. It's a lot of work. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have scaphism. All right, you guys, this one is also known as the boats or being eaten alive. And really, whatever way you swing it, it absolutely sucks so badly. This is an ancient method of execution that involved putting someone sandwiched between two boats stacked on top of one another. From here, they'll feed the person and cover them in milk and honey, and then they just leave them. From here, the substance is on and in the person will fester and attract bugs and other small vermin, which will then basically eat that person who can't fend for themselves alive. Not only would being eaten alive be one of the worst ways to go, but this process was in 
incredibly lengthy and ensured the person suffered for a really long time. Like, we're talking over 10 days here. In one of the first written mentions of scaphism, which comes from Plutarch in the life of Artaxerxes, while talking about the execution of Mithridates, he said, quote, When the man is manifestly dead, the uppermost boat being taken off, they find his flesh devoured, and swarms of such noisome creatures preying upon, and, as it were, growing to his inwards. In this way, Mithridates, after suffering for 17 days, at last expired. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, if Plutarch wants to go pay for my therapy after that, I'd be really grateful. In our number 9 spot today, we have drawn and quartered. This was a popular form of punishment and became the statutory penalty for men who were convicted of high treason in the Kingdom of England from 1352, although this form of punishment certainly existed well before that. Basically, whoever the convicted was, they would be secured to some sort of wooden panel and then drawn by horse to wherever this whole thing was going down. That wasn't said casually to make light of this horrible punishment, I'm just uncomfy, so I'm trying to keep it cool and casual. So once at the place of execution, the person would then be hanged, almost to the point of them losing their life, but from there they would then be emasculated, for lack of a better term, disemboweled, beheaded, and then quartered, or chopped into four pieces. All right, and because this simply wasn't enough for some insane reason, the pieces would then be displayed in prominent places across the country. Like, no, I do not want to see someone's upper right quadrant while going for breakfast. I'll pass on that. Thank you so much, though. In our number eight spot today, we have Mazatello. This one was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the Papal States for only some of the most terrible crimes or crimes that were considered especially loathsome. Basically, the person who was being executed would be led to a scaffold that was located in the public square because they didn't have Netflix back then, so instead they just watched people die. I don't know, it was weird. I'll keep watching Ginny and Georgia instead. But anyway, the person would be accompanied by a priest, and on this scaffold would lie a coffin and a masked executioner who was dressed in black. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, and then when the time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Sometimes Sometimes this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut. None of this sounds good. This one sucks so bad. I feel bad giving you guys this information. Next video, can it be like top 10 nice, cool, wonderful flowers or something instead? Top 10 dogs. Let's do that. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Blood Eagle. This messed up thing was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, who both happened to be members of the royal family, were placed in the prone position. They were laying flat on their tummies, they had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, and then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create a sort of super messed up and really scary and terrifying pair of wings. Both instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, the person was being punished for patricide or for killing their own father. So I guess definitely don't do that. I'm not really sure what the takeaway from this one is other than, wow, that sounds horrible and I'm really glad we don't do that anymore. I also really love my dad. In our number six spot today, we have keel hauling. This is a word that I wish I could erase from my vocabulary vocabulary, as it has to do with one of the most terrible punishments I've ever heard of. But I mean, I guess we've already talked about a bunch of these, so I should be used to it by now. The word for this punishment comes from the Dutch word keelhalen, which apparently means to drag along the keel, and that is exactly what this terrible method was all about. This punishment was usually reserved for sailors, and they would be stripped, tied, and suspended by rope from the mast of the ship with weights tied to their legs. The rope would be looped beneath the ship so that once the tied up sailor is released, they'd be dragged under the keel of the ship. In the world of the most unsurprising news ever, this method had basically a 100% fatality rate. Wow, it's almost as if you put someone in that situation that threatens their life in multiple ways, they just might not survive. How strange. Number five, the ordeal by fire. Also known as trial by fire, this one's a little bit different than being burned at the stake. Dare I say it's a bit worse? I don't know, it's certainly gonna last longer, which is worse in my opinion. This one here was a Viking punishment that involved subjecting the accused, this individual, to a test of endurance we can call it. They had to walk barefoot over hot coals or they had to hold hot iron 
in their bare hands. The belief here was that if the accused was innocent, they would be unharmed by this boiling hot fire. Whereas if they were guilty, well then, and only then, would they burn and suffer. This punishment was not unique to Vikings. It was used in various forms throughout history, medieval history. It was uh, it was huge in medieval Europe. They, they loved that. They loved uh, ordeal by fire, so that was a good time. Ancient India as well, they would perform such a task. However, there's some evidence to suggest that the Vikings may have used the ordeal by fire as a form of punishment and trial. For example, the Icelandic sagas, which are a collection of stories and history from medieval Iceland, they describe the use of ordeal by fire in legal proceedings, which Again, imagine being born in that era. Like, this is what you have to go and watch. I can't even watch UFC. I can't watch this guy burn. Are you kidding me? In one story, a woman was accused of adultery and then she was forced to walk barefoot over hot coals as part of her trial. Yeah, she emerged unharmed and was declared innocent, believe it or not. I choose not to believe that. I believe her feet were absolutely fucked, but hey, who am I? Number four, getting even. Taking another's life, yeah. Can't get much worse than that, can it? Nowadays, if you kill somebody, it's a bit different. Now, you'll get out early with good behavior, and then Netflix will do four miniseries all about you. Yeah, nice, you get your own Netflix special. Love it. Back in the Bjarki laws in the medieval Viking era, taking another's life was considered one of the most serious crimes, and the punishment for doing so varied depending on the circumstances of the crime, but well, it was all bad, wasn't it? Back then, if the killer was caught in the act, they could be killed well, on the spot, by the victim's family, or by the community. Over in 14 minutes flat, everyone goes home. No trial, nothing. If the killer was caught after the fact, they were typically subjected to a fine known as a wear guild, which was paid to the victim's family as compensation for the loss of their dearly loved one. And if the killer was unable to pay the fee, they could be subjected to other forms of punishment, including exile or even execution. Exile was brutal as well. You were declared an outlaw, then you were banished from Viking society with no legal protections or rights. This often led to you living in the wilderness, and that's terrifying, and that's lonely, and that lasts a while, and that's horrific. In some cases, the victim's family could also choose to enact vengeance on the murderer themselves rather than relying on the legal system. This could lead to a cycle of violence and revenge known as a blood feud that could last for generations. That's crazy. That sounds like it's something from a Batman comic. A cycle of revenge that could last generations. My God, let it go, Bruce. Number three, treason. Treason was defined broadly and it could include acts such as plotting against the king or queen, engaging in rebellion or insurrection, or providing aid to the enemy during wartime. Don't be a little snake, basically. Just don't do any of the above. The punishment for treason varied depending on the specific circumstances of the crime and which country it was committed. Now, this one's quite broad. You never know where you're gonna get, basically. In some cases, the punishment could be as bad as getting hanged or drawing and quartering, which which if you don't know, that would involve you being hung and then accused until nearly dead and then disemboweling them and cutting off their limbs before displaying the body parts publicly as a warning to others. So it's, yeah, it's the worst thing you've ever heard pretty much. In other cases, the punishment for treason could include imprisonment, which is the most normal sounding thing on this list, banishment, or simply a fine. Yeah, here you go, I'm gonna write that for you. Don't do that again. In some cases, the accused might be given the opportunity to plea for mercy and be granted a lesser punishment. I would plea so hard. I'd be the most pleasant, hard pleading peasant in all the land. That would be over so quick, I would beg. The severity of the punishment for treason reflected the belief that the crime was a threat to the stability and security of the state. And you can't really fuck with that. Medieval society highly valued loyalty to the monarch and the state and acts of treason were seen as a direct challenge to all of this loyalty. So as a result, treason was punished harshly in order to deter others from committing anything similar. Yeah, don't f with medieval times anywhere, anytime, anyone, at all, period. Number two, rats. In medieval times, rats were often seen as a symbol of disease and filth, and they were blamed for the spread of epidemics such as, you know, the Black Death, stuff like that gross little hairballs. As a result, rats were sometimes used in punishments in order to deter others from committing crimes because, well, they're disgusting. Nobody wants that to happen to them, right? One common punishment was to tie a rat to a person's body, place a metal bucket over top, heat up said bucket so the rat is then forced to burrow into the victim's flesh to escape. Pretty horrible, but it gets worse. Other punishments involving rats included throwing rats at a person's face, which kind of hilarious, kind of horrible, or forcing them to eat a live rat. Both of these sound like fear factor challenges. That is insane. You get caught stealing now, you have to eat a rat. Can you imagine that? So gross. I would rather do the time than have a rat get hucked at my face. 
Thank you so much, Judge. And finally, number one, the cup bearer. We'll finish with one of the worst jobs to have in medieval times. This one's not a punishment per se, but it's too funny to leave out. This job would make me so anxious. Oh my gosh. In medieval times, a cup bearer was a highly trusted servant in a noble household or court. Now, the cup bearer was responsible for the care and presentation of the lord or milady's beverages, ensuring that they were of high quality and served in appropriate vessels. Vessels where you can do this a lot. I know kings and queens like to do this a lot when they're giving their monologues. The cup bearer was also responsible for monitoring the lord or lady's health as their beverage could be laced with, you guessed it, poison. Yeah, gotta watch out for that, I hope. The cupbearer was often a position of great influence and power as they, of course, had access to the lord or lady at all times and could potentially use their position to manipulate history and gain favor with the ruling class. That would suck one day, wouldn't it? You take a sip and you're like, Oh, that's actually poison. This one's my last shift. That really sucks. Didn't think that would happen today. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress, but then it was realized how great and dangerous this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. 
slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf. And since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed. But with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. Number five, trial by ordeal. Trial by ordeal of water was insane. It's, it's honestly hilarious to think of. It was a medieval method of determining guilt or innocence. Now the accused would be thrown into a body of water, often a river or a pond, something dirty back then. And if they floated, well, it was believed that God was protecting them and that they were innocent. But if they sank, however, well, they were deemed guilty. They were naughty, right? This practice was based on the belief that water, being a pure element created by the Lord, would reject impurities such as sin. And it was also thought that drowning was an acceptable punishment for those who were deemed guilty. Because, yeah, sure. The trial by ordeal of water was widely used throughout Europe during the Middle Ages and continued until the early modern period. So yeah, it lasted a while. However, it was eventually abolished due to its high mortality rate and, well, lack of reliability in determining guilt or innocence. It was a bunch of bullshit. Who knew? Water rejects impurities. That would be jarring. You try and have a bath, you just get launched out. You're like, oh, okay then. Gotcha. Heard. Number four, the lead sprinkler. The lead sprinkler device dates back to medieval times, as all these great gadgets do, and it was used as a form of punishment for those who committed crimes such as heresy or treason. The device consisted of a hollow metal sphere with a long handle. It looks like something you'd get from Elden Ring. It's like a weird looking wand, I don't know. It was then filled with molten lead or boiling oil. You already know where I'm going with this one. The Punisher would then hold the sphere over the victim's naked body, always naked, again, and then allow the hot liquid to drip through small holes onto your skin, causing severe burns and excruciating pain. Now, over time, variations of the lead sprinkler were developed, including ones with multiple spouts to, you know, increase the amount of liquid being poured onto victim or victims. Yeah, they got creative. Just the thing you want to hear in this kind of list. They, uh, they toyed around with some ideas, sure. Number three, the guillotine. A classic, not quite ancient, but we gotta mention it. First seen in France during the late 18th century as an alternative to other forms of capital punishment, all those other horrible versions. Those were seen as cruel and inhumane, but this one, dare I say, changed the game. It quickly became the preferred method of execution in France and was used extensively throughout the French Revolution to execute thousands of people, including King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. The guillotine's popularity spread throughout Europe with several countries adopting it as their primary means of capital punishment. They're like, hey, that looks pretty cheap and horrible. Let's do that. It continued to be used until the mid 20th century when most countries abolished capital punishment punishment altogether. Now, despite its gruesome reputation, some argue that the guillotine was a humane method of execution because it was quick and painless compared to the other nine that I've mentioned on this list. Oh my God. Number two, the thumb screw. This one, for some reason, this one hits me the most. Thumb screws were a method of inflicting pain by crushing the fingers or the toes or sometimes the knees. They would make massive thumb screws. Knee screws, almost. The victim's digits were inserted into the screw and then it was slowly tightened, causing, of course, excruciating pain and potentially permanent damage. This form of punishment was commonly used during medieval times, of course, and as means of extracting information. Yeah, if you do that to me, I'd, I'll say anything in four minutes or less. It was also seen during the Spanish Inquisition to force confessions from those suspected of heresy. Thumb screws were often made of iron or brass and could be adjusted to increase or decrease pressure on your body. Anywhere, like I said earlier, they would get creative with where they would put these screws of death. Not good. Despite its brutal nature, thumbscrew torture remained in use for centuries before eventually falling out of favor due to its, well, extreme cruelty. At what point do you decide, right? Like some guy's like, you know what? It's a little bit too much. Let's get this one. We're just gonna put them in the coffin for now. Thumb screws are so old. And finally, number one, cement shoes. We'll end on a 20th century mafia punishment because why not, all right? I wrote the thing. I can talk about what I want. Let's do it. You made it this far too. We'll end on a not horrible one. Cement shoes involved placing the victim's feet in, well, as you could guess, buckets filled with wet concrete, which then of course hardens around their feet. Science right there. That's how that works. Unless you have a moving truck thing, then that cement's gonna dry pretty fast. At that point, you're unable to move or escape and the victim is then thrown into a body of water 
to sink down and drown. This brutal technique was popularized by organized crime groups and mafias and stuff like that back in the early 20th century as a way to dispose of informants or those who had betrayed the group betrayed the mafia. The first recorded use of cement shoes was in New York City in 1935 when two victims were found dead with their feet encased in concrete. Yeah, new fear unlocked. I never knew. There we go. Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take and most of the time your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods and the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree. My bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them. Maybe it was the same guy. I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this, but when you steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor. There's no battle for land. No fight for property. No bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, Wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently, although they sound the same in terms of brutality, and someone's losing their home regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards, it can vary. But one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area, hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung, like here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now this of course would upset the cow and it would thrash him about. Now if the man, at this point can keep hold of the cow's tail for a specified length of time. Why, he passed the test, of course, and then he was allowed to live on, and he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that, but back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could the fella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. Know what I mean? That's simple. Today, there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay, Viking law is done. Go home. Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot-headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments, so as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, one method of punishment in the later Viking age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity. So there were some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know. Either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You don't even want to know the rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's, it's close. Definitely. And 
Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. That's horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was not the Danish king of England back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears, while men were merely chastised. Not even close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who would killed their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point, that sounds terrible. Stand your ground until you can't anymore, the neck tower. This torture and execution was done in two ways, either in a tall narrow tower or in a tall wooden frame box. Either way, both tower or box could open only from the bottom side. A prison prisoner is put inside the wooden box frame or tower with only the neck protruding. Hands and feet would be shackled inside and only a towering pile of stones would be in there to stand on. However, each day, a stone or two is removed, dropping the prisoner lower and lower and lower by inches over the days, letting them die slowly by strangulation. Battle of the sexes with this torture, it's Zanzi, a form of crushing torture used to extract confessions or as a penalization for laws broken. Now may be a fun time to mention that the five laws of punishment I had just counted for you guys, those punishments actually only apply to men. For women, the five punishments are a different set and far less severe. First is grinding grain, second is the zanzi, which you're about to learn about, third punishment is beating, fourth is confinement, but also sometimes as mentioned she got her womb smacked about a little, and finally five, permission to take your own life. Not them killing you or telling you to do, no 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 no, this was some like side eye, well we're not telling you what to do, but you know what's up, dot 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 type of thing. Anyways, the Zanzi. This finger crusher was a Chinese instrument of torture consisting of small sticks strung together with cords which was then placed around the fingers and gradually pulled, causing agonizing pain inwards. Think being tricked into playing knuckle breaker by your older brother for the first time. Under traditional Chinese law, a person could not be convicted of a crime unless they confessed. The Zanzi was a legal and non-lethal torture method for forcing women to confess and for men there was a similar and more painful Jiagun ankle crusher, which uses three yard long wooden planks that slowly pulled and compressed the feet in an excruciating fashion that both broke tendon and bone. Time to snatch that waist ancient China style, the waist chop. Waist chopping first appeared in the Zhu dynasty and sadly no, it was not truly a plastic surgery alternative to get that slim thick summer look going. In reality it's when a prisoner is tied to a table, whether length wise or width wise, it doesn't matter. However, it's definitely far less comfortable to be chopped in half while also awkwardly dangling your arms and legs off of a table. Anyways, lying face down, the executioner was to try, try being the key word, to sever the person in half using a large fodder knife at the small of the back. These big ass knives were literally so heavy, it was more like teetering forward and letting the blade kind of slam into the person and hoping for the best. Sometimes, most times, the chopping was not limited to one blow. A story from 1734 describes Yu Hong Tu, the education administrator of Henan, was sentenced to a waist chop. After being cut into at the waist, he remained alive long enough to write the Chinese character Chen, which means cruel, seven times with his own blood before dying. After hearing this, the Yang Zheng Emperor abolished this form of execution. I guess maybe after learning what happened to Hong Tu, the emperor felt like half the man he used to be too. Huh? Yeah. We've heard it we've heard of it before. We'll hear of it again. It's Ling Chi, aka slow slicing. A regular torture and execution to reoccur in Bumblebee videos due to how far spread this torture traveled, how much it was used, and just how overall disturbing it is. Slow slicing, also known as death by a thousand cuts, was a form of torture and execution used in China from roughly 900 CE up until the practice ended around the early 1900s. The process involved tying the condemned prisoner to a wooden frame, usually in a public 
public place. The flesh was then cut from the body in multiple slices in a process that was not specified in detail in Chinese law and therefore likely vary per empire or century. Generally it consists of cuts to the arms, then the legs and chest leading to the amputation of the limbs, followed by decapitation or a stab to the heart. If the criminal was less serious or the uh, executioner more merciful, the first cut would be to the throat. The punishment worked on three levels, as a form of public humiliation, as a slow and lingering death, and as a punishment after death. To be cut into pieces meant that the body of the victim was not whole in the spiritual life after death, which is massively consequential to many Chinese people who believed reincarnation required being whole in death. It is described as a fast process lasting no longer than 15 to 20 minutes. The coup de grace was all the more certain when the family could afford a bribe to have the stab to the heart inflicted first. Some emperors ordered three days of cutting, while others may have ordered specific tortures before the execution for a longer execution. For example, records show that during Yan Chohan's execution, Yan was heard shouting for a half a day before his death. And finally, the nine degrees of punishment are ten shades of effed up. In the words of Mulan's Mushu, all right, that's it. Dishonor, dishonor on your whole family. Make a note of this. Dishonor on you. Dishonor on your cow. Well, the Qin Dynasty and a few others of China really felt this sentiment with their whole chest, and it shows in the creation of the nine degrees. See, the punishment involved the execution of close and extended family members. These included the criminal's living parents, the criminal's living grandparents, any children the criminal may have over a certain age, which varied depending on the time period and who was in control and what their definition of a child even was. Also siblings and siblings-in-laws, uncles of the criminal as well as their spouses, and of course the criminal himself. Imagine messing up so bad your whole family line just gets annihilated. We all have that cousin or sibling who would have screwed all of us by now if this still happened. A famous documentation of the Nine Degrees is the story of Fang, a Confucian scholar famous for his loyalty to the Emperor Jioan. When the Emperor is usurped and Fang is asked by the new one to write an inaugural address, well, Fang refuses. It's also ancient China, so realistically he knows exactly what refusal means, so that proves how metal his decision was. Even when threatened with family extermination, Fang showed his IDGAF attitude and is reported saying, never mind, nine agnates, go ahead with ten. Blowing steam out the ears, the emperor says, bet. And so Fang becomes perhaps the only case of extermination of ten agnates in the history of China. So quite literally, in addition to his own execution, the blood relations from all nine branches of his family hierarchy were killed. And as a kick to the nuts, his students and peers were added to be the tenth group. Random people unrelated to him who just happened to attend his lectures or work with the guy. Although altogether 873 people are said to have been executed. Because this guy refused to write a speech and when threatened said, do it bro, I dare you. Before death, Fang was forced to watch his brother's execution and then Fang himself was executed by waist cutting. And legend goes that prior to his death, he dipped his finger in his own blood and wrote on the ground the Chinese character Kuan, which means upsurper. Man was petty until the end and took 873 people with him to prove it. Also, they liked writing in blood a lot. Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particular violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those who had already been punished with exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked. So I mean pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison, number 9 is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favored way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water 
as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon, and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person, because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number 8 is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go to punishment for a non violent offender, like a thief, a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now, usually it came with expulsion, which, unlike exile, doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab, however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal re offended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had a three strikes then you're out system. In 1745, tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards arm tattoo. In 1872, the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number seven, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground. On one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes, tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously, this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not, as long hair was cultivated between both sexes, so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair, until they confessed, or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So number 6 is going to make me even more nauseous, it's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish, I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edo was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working, heck it can walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. In our number 5 spot today, we have the ducking stools. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century England in New England, and it was usually a punishment that was reserved for women. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly. Whatever that is supposed to mean. Apparently this included things like having an argument with their husband, fighting with the neighbors, gossiping and backstabbing. Whoever made these rules had clearly never met a man because newsflash, everyone does literally all of those things. But hey, clearly the logic used in the past was not logical. Basically, this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again. This was actually a punishment method that didn't usually end up in death, but that sounds like the worst consolation prize of all time. In our number 4 spot today, we have trial by ordeal. This one is aptly named because it really was a whole entire ordeal, and one that I'm sure absolutely none of us would have liked to have been a part of. This foolproof ancient judicial practice was used as a test to determine whether someone was 
was innocent or guilty. Spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it makes absolutely zero sense. Basically, the accused would be placed in the center of everyone and they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. If they survived the pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, they were guilty. Like, what kind of insanity is that? Apparently, there were a multitude of different ordeals people could be subjected to, like cold water, hot water, hot iron, really whatever option, they were all bad. What an insane idea to test someone's innocence. I'm just saying, I know a lie detector test is only 80 to 90% accurate, but I'll take that over this ordeal. In our number three spot today, we have death by elephants. There's a lot of messed up punishments we've talked about, but this one makes me extra angry because why do we need to include poor innocent animals in our terrible behavior? You know what I mean? Execution by elephant was quite a popular method of capital punishment in certain parts of the world. The elephants would be used to crush, dismember, or just inflict pain on captives who were being publicly executed. This method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use the elephants to signify both the ruler's power as well as their ability to control a wild animal. This practice began to die out in the 18th and 19th century as the parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in part because of their size and strength, but also because of their intelligence, domestic ability, and versatility. Although bears and lions were more popularly used in other parts of the world, elephants had the ability to be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they are so smart. I feel bad for the people who died like this, but I also feel really bad for the elephants who were forced to take part as well. In our number two spot today, we have the breaking wheel. All right, folks, buckle up for this one that was once used as a method of capital punishment. This method was most commonly used in Europe from antiquity through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. This was a super simple device and it really was just a wheel, but it was absolutely terrible. There are two different methods with the breaking wheel. Either the person would be broken on the wheel or by the wheel. So basically, excuse the gruesome descriptions, but if you were broken by the wheel, basically you'd be placed belly down on a board and then the wheel was slammed down twice on each arm and leg and then on the spine. You'd then be tied to the wheel and hammered to a pole. The pole would be put up for the victim to be left up there to die. Yeah. I know, I said it was gruesome, and we still have another one to get through. Being broken on the wheel involved the limbs of the victim being tied to the wheel and then smashed with a club, and in some places the wheel would spin, just to add a little extra terribleness. The number and the sequence in which the smashes were distributed were not random, however, as they were actually determined in a court sentencing. All right, let's keep going, we're almost done. In our number one spot today, we have rats. Man, this one really sums up how terrible human beings can be. Rat torture originally originated in ancient Rome and ever since then it unfortunately has been a part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure being strapped to his abdomen or chest. Inside this enclosure there were rats which the strapped down person can feel walking around and this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically hot coals were usually placed on top which of course very quickly creates a hot environment for the rat inside. From here, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out because, just like us, they have survival instincts. The metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. Well, you see where this is going. I don't need to say more, but just know that it is very, very painful and very, very horrible. And to make matters worse, this is only one of the terrible rat punishments there have been throughout history. So maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about another one. How fun would that be? Number 10, Judas Cradle. Right off the hop, we'll start with a bad one. I mean, they're all pretty bad, but this one is so specific, you know what I mean? This is a brutal torture device used in the medieval ages to punish those who were accused of adultery or blasphemy. Yeah, adultery. This is what would happen to you. Imagine this. The victim would be placed on top of a pyramid shaped seat, not really a seat at all, just a sharp pyramid, and they'd be slowly lowered onto it by ropes. Now, the pointed tip of said seat slash pyramid would penetrate their um, anything. Anything in this region at all, all bad, all rough time. And this, of course, would often lead to death due to infection. The Judas Cradle was painful. It was intimate and it was slow. It was horrible. It was considered an effective way of obtaining confessions from suspects. Even if they were innocent, they're like, sure, I did it. Get me off of this thing. What the fuck? This painful and gruesome method of punishment is thankfully no longer in use today, obviously. But occasionally, I'm going to pop up and remind you not to forget about it. It's horrible. The Justice Department has things to fix today. Sure, I'll say that but at least we're not lowering the accused onto the chair of death. Let's leave that one in the past. Number nine, 
the choke pair. Great name, already looking forward to this one. Also known as the Pair of Anguish. The Pair of Anguish was a medieval punishment device used to humiliate its victims, really. The device was inserted into the victim's mouth, or again, other places, and then slowly expanded open using a screw mechanism until it reached its full size. Yeah, almost like something from Saw, just like that, exactly. This caused immense pain and often resulted in permanent injury or, of course, as you can imagine, death. The choke pair was also used to extract confessions from suspects or prisoners. Despite its gruesome nature, the choke pair actually remained in use for centuries and was only officially banned in the 19th century. Yeah, you're like, what is this, ancient Egypt, Rome, Greek, what is this? No, it's like 200 years ago. Today, examples of the device can be found in museums. So if you see something that looks kind of like a choke pair, they're all fancy for some reason. Take a minute and reflect on these horrors. They used to punish men for homosexuality with a choke pair. Humans are disgusting. Number eight, scaphism. First used in ancient Persia. The victim here would be stripped naked and placed inside of two hollowed out tree trunks or sometimes boats. But only their heads, hands, and feet were exposed. You were literally stuck in a tree. Now, if that's not already uncomfortable and haunting in the hot sun already, they would then be force fed honey and milk until they were extremely ill. And of course, all that happening in tight quarters inside of a tree trunk well, as time passed, maggots would eat away at the victim's flesh, causing infections and gangrene. And also, it's horrible, it's so uncomfortable. The process could take days or even weeks to kill the victim. This method of punishment was meant to be slow and painful, and of course, the typical ancient fashion, it was very public. Everyone came out to watch, serving as a warning to others who may have committed similar crimes that somehow deserve being stuck in a tree. No way. Number seven, the punishment of non-existence. Ooh, this one's pretty good. It's different, but it's definitely worth a mention on our list today. When we talk about pharaohs or pretty much anything from ancient history, we know nothing. I mean, really, so many books destroyed, that much time passed. There's countless leaders that we know nothing of, and it has a little something to do with Donatio Memoria. Donatio Memoria was a practice in ancient Rome that involved erasing the memory of an individual or a group from history, just ever, gone. Control, alt, delete, see you later, Brad. This was done by destroying any and all physical evidence of their existence, such as statues or inscriptions, and banning the use of their name. That's incredible. It was typically used to punish individuals who had committed treason or other crimes against the state, but it could also be applied to those who were, well, simply unpopular with the ruling class. Yeah, getting canceled, but in ancient Rome, there we go. You guys scratching your face out of a rock. He's like, nah, you don't exist anymore, buddy. How's that sound? That's horrible. That is so, I mean, cutting to 2023 now. Yeah, they're gone. We have no idea who they are. The effectiveness of this varied depending on the circumstances. I mean, in some cases, it succeeded in erasing the memory or the group completely, while in others, it only generated more interest in them. You know what I mean? You cancel somebody now today and you're like, well, who are these people? What did they do? Today we do this, but it's just, you know, blocking somebody on socials. Mute. See ya. Number six, Iron Maiden. Great, now run to the hills. It's gonna be stuck in my head all day. Not bad, honestly not bad. Hit the thumbs up for the Iron Maiden band. Not for this content, just for the band. Iron Maidens were tricky. An Iron Maiden was a device used in the Middle Ages and it was an upright coffin shaped humanoid looking box with spikes on the inside that would puncture the victim when they were placed inside and had that big scary door closed. The spikes were long enough to cause significant pain and injury, but not long enough to kill the victim immediately. Ergo, horribleness. The victim would be left inside for hours or even days, slowly succumbing to their injuries and eventually dying from infection or, well, just blood loss. This method of punishment was considered uh, cruel due to its prolonged nature and the physical torment that it inflicted on the victim. Because yeah, even without the spikes inside, this one would drive me nuts. Oh, terrifying. It's like the movie Buried, but somehow worse. Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles. Then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard anything. Number four, solitary confinement. 
This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So, you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. Yeah.